You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagun Yedile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome, everyone. And um, this is another episode of Body Banter. And I am Shegun Yedele, and I come to you today from Kelowna, which is in the traditional unceded ter- territories of the Silks Okanagan nations. And as usual, my friend and colleague, Claudia, is here. Hi, Claudia. Hi, everyone. I'm Claudia Krebs, and I'm also joining you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the uh, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. It is so nice to be here with everyone. We have a huge panel today, Shagan, um, and we're going to be talking about a really important topic, and that is about different types of bodies, different sizes of bodies, and we've really assembled a star-studded cast here. Um, Let's start with a round of introductions. So we have Jeffrey, Rebecca, and Natalie here. Um, Rebecca, maybe you can start us off. Yes, it's so wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm Rebecca Pearl. I'm an assistant professor in clinical and health psychology and social and behavioral sciences at the University of Florida College of Public Health and Health Professions. Welcome. And we have Jeffrey. Thank you so much for having me. So yeah, I'm uh, Jeff Hunger. I'm a, a social and health psychologist and an assistant professor at Miami University, uh, the one in Oxford, Ohio not in Florida, in case anybody's wondering. Uh, I'm not slipping out to like South Beach after this. Uh, So uh, very briefly, you know, my lab studies the mental and physical health effects of of stigma really broadly, but a lot of what we do centers around sort of the harmful effects of weight stigma. Welcome. And Natalie, can you introduce yourself? Yes, yes. I'm excited to be here um, as well. Thank you. My name is Natalie Lociavo. I'm a registered dietitian. Um, and my, I work at Balanced Nutrition is my practice. We are located in the Philadelphia suburbs of Pennsylvania, um, and we primarily focus on um, nutrition as it relates to mental health. So we work with a lot of individuals with eating disorders, and as a result, um, we're very passionate and very invested in um, kind of looking at weight stigma and trying to educate people on it um, in, in hopes to combat it. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we have such a lovely set of people and very knowledgeable and experienced. Uh, This is like what you do and encounter every day. And so today we're really talking about bodies and uh, particularly uh, bodies that are on the largest side and the effect of that in daily living, particularly as anatomists, uh, we encounter bodies um, in the dissection table. Uh, We encounter bodies like in the clinics when the students go out into the clinics. And, you know, it's not unusual in the anatomy lab. And I'm going to start with you, Rebecca, because in the anatomy lab, when we, when there's a particularly large cadaver on the, on the dissecting table, it's kind of elicits some reaction from students um, in terms of, oh, I'm not going to do this. I don't want to be here and all of that. Um, where does that come from and how can we how can we re-educate or educate our students to accept uh, those types of bodies uh, in a more accepting way? Yeah, well, that's a very big question of, and and is kind of the question that I think everybody here is is, you know, spending a lot of um, effort and time and energy trying to solve of how do we change the way that people think about weight and bodies. Um, And what you described of this kind of negative reaction from students is something we've seen in research, too. Um, So I was part of a a research group led by Addie Goss, who was a medical student at the time, um, doing research on anatomy education among first year medical students and finding that a large uh, proportion of students 
reported negative feelings and attitudes about cadaver bodies that had higher body weights. Um, and we found that the uh, anatomy experience um, not only changed how they were thinking about the cadavers, but also extended to negative attitudes about thinking about patients with larger bodies and even about their own bodies of you know, having feelings like disgust um, toward their own bodies or thinking about bodies with of larger size. Um, and there were also themes of thinking that these bodies were unhealthy um, and calling them difficult, uh, kind of in thinking about, you know, the dissection and, and handling them in the anatomy course. So um, this is, you know, very upsetting to hear that just early on in first year medical school classes, we're already seeing these kinds of um, automatic negative responses. And and there really is a need to intervene because we know that healthcare professionals um, who are treating patients and are well out of medical school still report these kinds of feelings of disgust and blame and, and negative attitudes toward toward patients. Um, and maybe I'll I'll stop there because I think there's also a bigger conversation of what is this bias and you know how how is it so prevalent and how do people come to to have these beliefs. Um, but I, I really like your question of kind of starting from the get-go of what do we do about this? Thank you so much, Rebecca. Natalie, I'm going to ask you, um, because you work directly with patients who might be um, experiencing these feelings of disgust with their own body, of shame, of guilt, um, and who are struggling with these eating disorders. What, what is your daily practice like? Like, Tell us a little bit more about the folks that you work with and the effect of this bias on their lives and their mental health. Sure. Um, so a lot of times the work that I'm doing with clients who experience this um, weight bias and, and weight stigma in healthcare are is kind of talking it through with them. A lot of them don't even realize um, that they're being discriminated against. They don't realize that this isn't their fault, um, that they're being mistreated because this is often the narrative they have as well about themselves. So uh, often we start by kind of peeling apart those layers and um, I help them to understand what weight stigma is, what weight bias is, uh, some of the, the roots of it and what's underneath it. Um, first to educate. And then a lot of times it's empowering them when they are going to the doctors, what can they do to kind of put on some armor to anticipate, to advocate for themselves and for their, for proper care. Um, Cause oftentimes they're not receiving it um, as a result of, of weight bias. Um, and then, you know, I usually am working very close with therapists who do really tend to the emotional and, and mental health impact um, of possibly a lifetime of this type of marginalization and discrimination and how to survive that um, and how to to live in a world that uh, views them as in these different ways. Yeah, yeah. So what, what all of you are talking about is that there's like real world consequences there's real world impact of of um of the way society the way we all have looked at, at people with larger body size and i'm wondering what jeff uh, to come to you what does the research about stigma say generally you know um in terms of what's like the highlights uh, in the way the effect it has on people uh kind of self esteem issues um, you know, maybe even long-standing issues that things that people really need help with over a long period of time. What what's the direction of research uh, about that? Yeah, that's you know a, a fantastic question. I think something you know Natalie has kind of touched on or we've touched on a little bit is it has implications, really widespread implications across mental and physical health. You know, so we know, for example, that weight stigma is a, a huge predictor of things like disordered eating. Uh, we know that it's a, a really strong predictor of anxiety, of depression, of social phobia, of sort of all of these sort of suite of, of mental health outcomes. But at the same time, it's also incredibly harmful for our physical health, you know, for a few different reasons. Like we, you know, it's just itself, it's stressful. Like I mean, folks listening to this podcast can recognize that stress is bad for for physical health. You know, we know that weight stigma 
uh, is associated with an increase in you know, cardiovascular reactivity, you know, stress hormones like cortisol, you know, changes in eating behavior, changes in other health behaviors that all sort of come together to really also undermine sort of physical health. So, and beyond that, we know that it kind of disconnects us from our social world. So if we think about sort of three components of, of well-being, it's our mental health, it's our physical health, and it's our, our social health. It's like, you know, how connected we are to others and feeling like we sort of have integration into society, feeling like we have folks to turn to. And weight stigma also hurts that. Like weight stigma also kind of undermines this idea of, of our social well-being. And so it is like, you know, not to, not to be hyperbolic, it, it is impacting every domain of life, every sphere of well-being. And, you know, so much so that it's related to mortality. Like we know that that experiences with weight-based discrimination is a risk factor for mortality over and above a whole host of the things that we would normally expect to predict it. And so I think that it has just got such this widespread impact that I think folks don't necessarily recognize. They may think, you know, it it hurts self-esteem or it makes you feel bad in the moment, but actually the, its impact is incredibly, incredibly widespread. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. And I wanted to touch on something you said and maybe explore that a bit further because you mentioned cardiovascular um, ideation, you know, and I think the idea out there is that uh, being of the larger size is not healthy, you know, being, you know, having a, a large size uh, body weight is not healthy. Um, it has cardiovascular issues. And, and I wanted to explore that. And maybe, maybe Rebecca, Rebecca will talk a little bit about that as well in terms of what, I, what does the research actually say? Does, does it automatically mean that somebody who is who has a larger body size is unhealthy? It that's the assumption. You know, everyone is sort of walking around with, with this assumption that you know higher body weight equals poorer health. And we know from work in our lab and in work, you know, uh, you know, in a bunch of other labs that that's just not true. Like when we look at indices of weight, things like BMI, even things like body fat percentage, do not do a fantastic job of predicting actual heart outcomes, you know, we're thinking about cardiometabolic outcomes, cardiovascular outcomes, things like that. And so even on their own or on its own, weight is not a fantastic predictor of these, these long-term health outcomes. And that says nothing about when that relationship exists. Like when we do see a relationship between being heavier and poorer health outcomes, that could all be a function of stigma. Like that's never integrated into how we research it in like sort of a standard medical model. A standard medical model about how we think about the health implications of weight are what is weight predicting? What is weight correlated with? Not really thinking about that this co-varies with a lot of negative social experiences. And so one of the parallels that I like to draw is the idea of this relationship between sexual orientation and mental health. Sexual orientation is a huge predictor of mental health, uh, of poor mental health. There's not a lot of folks that are walking around saying that being depressed is an inherent component of being gay. You know, they're, they're recognizing that the reason why sexual orientation is associated with mental health outcomes is because we live in an anti-gay society, just like we live in an anti-fat society that could sort of tighten that link between weight and health when it does exist. Thanks, Jeff. That was super powerful um, to, to draw those linkages between broader societal issues that we have. And that brings me to my next question. And um, maybe Rebecca, Natalie, or Jeff, of course, if you can weigh on this, where does the fat phobia come from? I mean, we can see it now. The Instagram filters are all to make everybody super thin. And, you know, we, there are makeup tutorials to make sure that your face looks really skinny and everything than the way that you apply different colors or whatnot. Um, but this didn't start with Instagram. Where are the origins of our society's fat phobia? That's a, a really great question. And there are a lot of, um, you know, potential sources and, and factors related to this. Um, so, you know, one kind of overarching driver of weight bias is a, a fundamental misunderstanding about weight controllability. Um, so it's really a, a common message and has been throughout time 
that people can directly control their weight. And so people who are viewed as unable to control their weight are then labeled with negative character traits and there's a moral judgment. And this, this also goes back you know, a long time if you've been thinking about religions and how weight and aesthetics are kind of tied to morality. Um, but there's a, you know, a, a really um, vast misunderstanding that, you know, weight is entirely within an individual's control. And so those who are, are viewed as unable to control their weight are viewed as lacking self-control, um, you know, lacking moral character. And that's where a lot of this blame comes from. Um, and that's where a lot of these Instagram, you know, messages and and weight loss and diet, bad diet advice comes from, um, from this kind of fundamental view that you should be able to control your weight. And this is really misguided because of course we know there are so many factors that influence any given individual's weight and shape. Um, there are genetic factors, um, biological factors, especially once someone has uh, gotten to a higher weight, they're at a set point and there are biological factors that fight against losing weight at that point. Um, and then of course, all the social determinants of health that affect access to healthy foods, the ability to be active. Um, so I think this is a really critical part of the, the root of weight bias is this assumption that people should be able to control their weight. And if they're not controlling their weight, then that means there's something wrong with them. Um, the other piece of this, and or one other piece of this anyway, is the aesthetic piece. And so, you know, there have been changes in body ideals and aesthetics over time. Um, and there are also differences by culture. Um, but certainly in, uh, you know, Western society where it is kind of predominantly white or Eurocentric focused ideals and cultures, this aesthetic of thinness has really become highly prevalent. Um, and uh, it might take different forms at times, right? Like there have been changes of a more of a focus on muscularity at, at different times, but it, it still is kind of impressing upon people that there's a right way to look and a wrong way to look. Um, and the right way to look is very narrow um, and, you know, not actually feasible or, or possible for the majority of people. Um, but again, kind of a tying a morality to it is is really um, salient, I think, in our culture and and what leads people to consistently feel like they need to strive to achieve those body ideals. Thanks, Rebecca. Natalie, you work with these patients directly. You've talked about the poor health outcomes. You, one thing that struck me in your statement earlier was that people you teach people to put on armor so that they can go to healthcare appointments and advocate for themselves. Um, that's super sad. Tell me more about this and, and sort of uh, the biases that the folks that you treat encounter in the healthcare system and what we can do to, to help with that. Sure. I agree. It is very, very sad. Um, and infuriating and a lot of other other things um, and also just such a health risk for these individuals so um, as Jeff was stating you know the weight bias and weight stigma does impact physical health and part of that is because so many people in larger bodies aren't going to doctor's appointments um, they are foregoing you know preventative care and oftentimes are delaying um, doctor's visits for more acute issues for fear of discrimination. And, and oftentimes with under this very fair assumption that their condition is going to be written off as a product of their weight um, and that they're not going to receive treatment. Um, and, you know, their stories are they really are heartbreaking. I just had a, a session the other day with a client who went in and actually we had communicated and kind of planned for this doctor's visit. She hadn't seen her primary care physician for a few years in person due to virtual care and the pandemic. Um, and she was going in in person and she was very nervous to be weighed. And she's done a lot of work and she's done a lot of reading um, on, on this topic. And she's very well educated herself, just in, in general, she's a professor of communications. So she speaks eloquently. Um, and she asked to not be weighed. Um, and they 
told her, the doctor actually told her that it was required by insurance, which is not the case, um, actually. And it's oftentimes something that I think that people are either misinformed about or that they lean on. Um, and she spoke more with the doctor about her concerns about it, why it was so difficult, and then ultimately felt forced to get on the scale and, and be weighed. Um, luckily, this clinician did at least care enough to understand the, the somewhat understand the fear and anxiety there. But my, my client did send me a message after the appointment and said that she was in tears during it and felt very almost violated because she was requesting for a medical procedure basically, right? Or, or to not be done. And she was refused that right. Um, and that's a small example of some of the, you know, stories that you hear um, and, and the impact that it has on these individuals. It really, um, it is devastating to answer your question, kind of how do we prepare them for it? It's tough because a lot of times we can do all of that work. We, I you know, we talked through a script and we, we talked about how it is her right to get on the scale or not get on the scale. And I think what's devastating is that when you're in front of a clinician as a patient, um, there is, there's a, a power imbalance, whether there should be or not, right? And so there is so much, they're already bringing something that is so vulnerable to them and, and is, is filled with so much shame. And then to, and if when they're questioned on it or when it's denied them, um, a lot of times they don't have it in them in that moment um, to kind of fight the way that they would like to. And they're left, so they're left feeling invalidated. They're left feeling sad, shamed, and also, um, frustrated with themselves ultimately because they they wanted to do more they wanted to advocate more but because of that perceived power imbalance they they felt shut down um so there's so much you know that goes on for these individuals in these even these small moments let alone um the examples that are much more devastating thanks natalie and uh, i'll let you in jeff um i was actually going to come come back to you I just wanted to make a comment that it's really, really heartbreaking, you know, in, in terms of the fact that the the very place where you would not expect to be shamed, where you would not expect to be stigmatized, you know, in, your, in the healthcare system, among your own, among the clinicians, that's exactly the place where people look down on you. And, and, and I think this is really important for, 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 for those of us who teach uh, students who are going to work in the clinical space uh, to be able to just get this message across that, you know, fat is not shameful, fat is not unhealthy, you know, there is nuance to this. And unfortunately, society does not do nuance very well. Um, you know, and I was going to, you know, talking of cultural, because um, I'm, I'm from Nigeria originally I've mentioned this on the podcast before and I've lived in South Africa where and in African societies you find that a fad is actually something desirable which is very interesting you know it's this just shows that it's it's a it's a cultural construct it's a maybe western thing you know because in other societies and I can remember and I can think of other Asian societies where being on the larger side is actually something that is desirable and people are not stigmatized for that they're not unhealthy because of that I, I, and i don't know whether you want to talk about this uh jeff to to say um the need to continually just pass this information out and and and, and educate people and and try to affect the, the way society thinks about this yeah, I, I will take this as an opportunity to address a few things. I promise I won't grandstand too much. Um, but I, I think that that Natalie's starting with Natalie's uh, client's description there is really uh, why we see weight stigma as such a potent predictor of things like healthcare avoidance, because you can be a professor of communications, you can have a knowledgeable provider like Natalie, you can go with every piece of sort of every weapon in your arsenal to make sure that you are given the care that you want. And then of course it doesn't happen because the bias is so strong within that field. And I think that it is, I think for fat folks, they know that the healthcare field is one of the, the domains that this is the most common and the most potent and unfortunately the most impactful because it is this huge barrier 
to getting the same care as their thinner counterparts would get. And we see example after example of the ways in which weight bias leads to delay or avoidance of care or misdiagnosis that ultimately just harms, you know, fat patients um, for nothing other than, you know, sort of the 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 power of, of weight stigma. But to to speak a little bit more to the, the the culture piece, I think it's it's really important to think about that. Yeah, there are there will be places in which weight stigma is not as prevalent because weight doesn't s- signify the same things that it does, at least in in Western society, in in an American society in particular. And we see this having fluctuated across time, even within the U.S. We know that there are times, I think Rebecca kind of touched on this, there are times even in our history since the 1900s where the curvy ideal was, was sort of the thing, the, the pinup curvy ideal sort of pushed back against sort of the, the really narrow, rigid perceptions of like what would be an acceptable body. But unfortunately, Western society, American society is doing too good of a job of exporting its ideals, of getting these ideals everywhere. And so it's harder and harder to find places, like you're saying, that might actually value fatness or see it as not a signifier of shame or of poorer health, but something that is actually valued. And it's becoming more and more challenging to find those places. Thanks, Jeff. I think that's a really uh, important point. Um, Rebecca, when you listen to Jeff's comments and Natalie's comments, what what comes to your mind in terms of actions that need to be taken? Yeah, and, and I'm also thinking about this opening question of what do we do about this? Um, I think to go off of both what Jeff said and, and Natalie's example of, you know, you can have patients who are doing their best to advocate for themselves. Um, and I think that's important and we need people supporting those advocacy efforts and, and helping patients move through this society that we live in um, to try to mitigate the harm that stigma does and prevent those harms. And at the same time, in order to really eradicate stigma or prevent these instances from happening, we need structural changes. Um, So, you know, it, it shouldn't be up to a patient to be having to explain to their doctor why they don't want to be weighed. This should be something that is kind of ingrained in healthcare professionals, in settings, the entire environment needs to be set up in a way that's accepting and safe and supportive for people of all bodies. Um, We need policy changes uh, in the healthcare system, in our legal system, uh, in order to protect and prevent against these forms of discrimination and and stigmatizing experiences. Um, And we need cultural shifts. So Claudia, you talked about social media earlier. Um, And in some ways, there have been some positive developments with social media and kind of giving more people a voice to change conversations um, and giving people power who maybe ordinarily would not have power to be part of those conversations. Um, But this is really going to take a bigger cultural shift uh, in order to fundamentally change the way that people are, are thinking about weight and treating people because of their weight. Thank you, Rebecca. I totally agree. We need policy changes around this and just attitude changes. One thing that really strikes me that I've been thinking about in this conversation is um, why are we constantly trying to control other people's bodies and our own bodies? And this sort of weight police, if you want, is really part of that. And it made me think of um, how we control, well, body shape, but also things like hair. There were policies in place, um, you know, about how to control hair, how to control curly hair. Um, I have a family full of curly people. (laughs) And um, especially my youngest has very, very curly hair. And there's, I have to fight that impulse, even myself to control her hair in the morning before she leaves the house. Like, don't you want to have a, don't you want to pull it back today? And she's like, no, I'm fine. And it's like, yes, you are. Yes, go. You look great. And but there's that urge in all of us to to control things, right? Whether it be hair or bodies. Where does that urge come from? Natalie, I'll start with you. I'm going to because it's a tough question, right? That's a big, 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 big question. Um, So I will I will weigh in probably just a tiny little bit on it. 
I mean, I think, and it's interesting that you you brought up hair and, and hair texture, but I think one thing that and we, I don't think we need to necessarily get in too deep on this topic because um, it's also a very big one, but there's some really good books out there um, for listeners if, if they want to learn more. Um, Sabrina Strings, it comes to mind, um, Fearing the Black Body. Um, that a lot of this weight stigma is is really rooted in in very racist um, history, and so again, I, I won't pretend to be educated enough on that to speak on it. Nor is that exactly what we're here to talk about today. But um, I think our desire, I think some of it comes from that. You said kind of a, as a in a more global sense or a more social sense. I think um, there's a lot of ties to that in terms of what why we want to control. Um, and where that comes from on a more individual level, um, you know, I, I can speak from the lens of working with individuals with eating disorders. And I think that we're often talking about how they use their bodies to, as a, as a means to control and, and to, to find control in something, um, when they can't in other things. Right. And so manipulating their weight or trying to, um, is, is one, one thing that many people feel that they can kind of hold on to and, and latch on to when they're feeling out of control in other areas, um, including emotions. So a lot of my clients too are, are desiring to control emotions that feel too big, maybe emotions of shame that come from being stigmatized. Um, and they do so using food and their bodies. Thanks, Natalie. So this is sort of the individual using their body and their weight to control things that are out of their control or to have some control over something. Jeff, you were going to jump in about this control issue as well, controlling bodies. And maybe you can comment in Rebecca, you as well, on um, how this disproportionately affects those who identify as women. I absolutely can't speak to that uh, specifically, but I think when I think about control as a psychologist, I can think about it almost at those same two levels that that Natalie talked about at the individual and sort of the societal level. You know, at the individual level, uh, you know, we are motivated to see our world as predictable, to see ourselves as stable. And part of that is a function of feeling the sense of we have control over our um, our outcomes, over our 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 world. This is sort of just a fundamental human motivation. And so at the individual level, it makes sense that folks are going to seek out control. And that motivation at some times is going to sort of have these really maladaptive forms like Natalie's talking about, where sometimes that, that strive for control, which is the sort of this fundamental motivation we all have, can find very, very you know dark and damaging places. Uh, at the societal level, I think that we can think about stigma as a source of social control. Like a stigma exists as a means of controlling others. We are stigmatizing certain groups over uh, certain groups and not others because stigma serves this a few functions. It serves the function to sort of keep folks out of our group that we don't want. Uh, it serves to keep the folks that are um, in our group following our norms, following our kind of rules, our sort of ideals, our set of sort of things about our group. And it also keeps the hierarchy in place. So stigma exists to keep certain groups above others. And so all of those things are about control. And so it doesn't shock me that we see this motivation to control people, you know, on the basis of their hair, or their weight, their all sorts of appearance related things on, on, you know, top of a whole other bunch of dimensions that we seek to sort of control people on. Wow, stigma as a form of control, that's super powerful. That really hit me. Rebecca, do you want to comment on this control issue? I think we, we've hit a nerve here. Yeah, and I, I think what Jeff said is so on point. And um, I wanted to also kind of loop in the public health perspective in this, um, because public health in many ways is about you know, social pressures or kind of social control of deciding what are the behaviors that we want to incentivize, what are the behaviors we want to discourage. Um, so, you know, we've decided that wearing a seat belt is a good idea. And so for public safety, we have requirements and policies around, seat, you know, cars having seat belts and us wearing seat belts. 
Um, and I think also about the example of smoking, right? That at some point it was decided that it was a strategy to stigmatize smoking and discriminate against smokers, right? Where we don't allow smoking in most places. Um, and with weight though, you know, there is this pressure, right? To have a certain weight that's been kind of decided upon at the public health lens. But there are a lot of differences uh, between, you know, incentivizing or discouraging a behavior versus a person's being or a person's body. Uh, and I think this also goes back to this misunderstanding of, you know, having a high weight is not a personal choice based on, you know, behaviors alone that can be controlled. Um, so I think this, yeah, but just to kind of loop the social control piece back to public health and where some of these pressures and control, you know, tendencies and messages come from. Um, Claudia, you also kind of brought up why women may be, you know, disproportionately affected. And I do want to say that men are affected and people of all genders and sexes are affected by stigma. And sometimes there's an underestimation of how men are affected because it might look different or might um, be reported differently or come out in different ways. But I think also, you know, women in our society, A, there's there's different pressures around control, right, that's based on um, stigma and discrimination due to gender. Um, but also, we're in a society in which appearance and beauty are um, more, you know, important uh, or kind of viewed as more important for women. And there's more pressure for women to uphold these beauty and aesthetic ideals. Um, and so that is why, for example, we know like weight thresholds of what's considered an acceptable weight tend to be stricter for women than for men. Uh, so it, this also, I think, speaks to all these intersecting forms of stigma that Natalie and Jeff have touched upon with race, with gender, with sexual orientation, um, that all of these have commonalities across the different forms of stigma and when intersecting kind of lead to even more mistreatment and bias. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, I think what's becoming very apparent is that this is a really deep topic and we cannot do it justice in like an hour of discussion. But it's it's great, too, because we've actually been able to highlight some of the themes that are that are, that, that are common to stigma about weight. You know, uh, it's about intersectionalities and so many different types of identity it's uh, intersectionality with race with uh, the issues of of culture um the, the personal issue the healthcare setting uh, policy issues that need to be addressed uh, education teaching uh, in teaching settings so there's lots and lots and lots of strands to this discussion and what i do hope is that we can bring the three of you back at some point to explore this further. Uh, but we will we'll need to wrap up today. Uh, but we always wrap up with this question. And uh, I'll start with you, Jeff, uh, being my my uh, fellow my fellow bud here <laughs> on this uh, on this um, podcast. And, and that's uh, in your professional uh, life uh, and all like your educational experiences, you, you probably have done some anatomy uh, or not, but generally speaking, uh, and it, whatever you know, way you want to address this, the question is, what is, do you have a favorite body part? What is your favorite body part? <laughs> That's such a, uh, I, I love that question. Uh, is it a favorite body part of my own? Like my own favorite body part? Like you could take you know? this so many different ways. <laughs> and I appreciate you assuming I have any experience in anatomy. That makes me feel uh, very great. Uh, I started as a pre-med student my first year. And obviously I'm talking to you as a PhD in social psychology. So I didn't go that route. Uh, so anatomy never came across for me. Um, I would say my favorite body part, uh, if I'm just going to use my own, is my legs. Because I love to cycle. It's in the, the power that is there. I love, I just crushed a climb ride before we got on this call. And I think that is sort of, for me, one of my favorite body parts. Amazing. Rebecca, what about you? What's your favorite body part? Also, speaking uh, as someone with no anatomy <laughs> experience, um, 
I, it's funny that Jeff said legs. I was going to say arms, uh, because like you can just, you do so much. I mean, I've been like gesticulating this whole time as I've been talking, you can lift things. Um, and I just think they're cool. I also really enjoy dance performances. So I love what people can do with their arms, the shapes that you can make. So I'm going to go with arms. And how about you, Natalie? I'm up. Um, this is bad because I actually did. Well, it was just a basic A and P class. So I feel like I'm still off the hook. Um, Okay, actually, what, so I was going to say facial expressions, right? Like, and I, so the face, but tell, educate me, what would you say are like, because I feel like, I don't know, this no, viewers can't see what I'm doing, but I'm showing from like my, the top of my eyebrows to like right under my lips. What are some of those body parts? You are right. It's it's the face and you're hitting on something really super important. I mean, Claudia can take the next hour to talk about <laughs> the face because she takes that lecture in our neuro anatomy lab in terms of um yeah the face and how it's wired to the brain and how it's wired to emotion and it's I a need, whole right. real so you've touched I, on and, something and so important the, the reason exactly the reason i think I, that it, i like it the most is it's it's i feel like you can learn so much about a person from that um so yeah so claudia we'll hook up and you can teach me all about the face that sounds great. Be delighted to do that. <laughs> so we've talked about our favorite body parts, which is so important because um, as we're talking about diversity of bodies and everything, I think it's really important to affirm that we love bodies, right? Like we we live in bodies and we love other people's bodies, right? Um, and we have favorite parts of bodies. But we might also have a body part that we're kind of like meh about or that we actually dislike. So, Jeff, what's your least favorite body part? Oh, I would have to say personally, it's my back. You know, at this point, as a 36 year old, sleeping on a random couch is like a roulette wheel of like, am I going to wake up in pain or not? And so I wish I could go back to my 20 year old self where I was just free freewheeling and had a back uh, that could sleep on a floor and I'd be fine. Now it's if it's not a very specific thread count, you know, my back is thrown off. I think you're still doing great, Jeff. I mean, crushing those <laughs> those bike rides. I mean, that's excellent. I, I appreciate I be, it. I want to be like you. <laughs> um, Rebecca, any least favorite body part? Uh, you know, I have a pinky toe that I broke like 10 years ago and is now just like a nugget <laughs> on my foot that I just have to like cram into shoes and doesn't really have much purpose anymore. So I would say that pinky toe is my least favorite body part. Fair. It's it's small and you get to tuck it into shoes. So uh, how about you, Natalie? Your least like, Rebecca, like not necessarily on yeah, I ahead. love that mine's I have a pinky finger that's short. I we don't even know what I did to it, but the growth plate is like non-existent. So I have a short pinky finger and gloves are devastating. Okay, so is that your least favorite that's body my part? Least, uh, yes, that was my the least pinky. favorite one. There you go. Okay. I feel like the least favorite body parts here were more an indication of take care of yourselves, like take care of your back, take care of your feet, and accept your nice small pinky finger. And you know what? We talked about structural change. Maybe the glove makers need to make you a special glove. I love that. <laughs> That's so cool. Thank you so much, Claudia. And thank you, everyone. And that brings us to the end of this episode of Body Banter, just to really, really appreciate Jeff and Rebecca and Natalie for um, bringing up such an important topic and helping us to ex explore it further. And uh, and so uh, anything you want to say, Claudia, and, and to wrap up today? I guess just be kind to your bodies and be kind to other people's bodies. And we look forward to seeing you at or being present in your earphones for the next episode. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun. And we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.